fact, I swear we get more activity during the day than we do um, at night a lot of times. So we still have tickets for the four o'clock. They're $25 a person. Um, and we will have a paranormal team here. Uh, Spiritual Realm will be here. Um, what's kind of interesting is they have one of those cameras, if you've seen it on any of the ghost shows where they show the, the, the stick figure. And the last time they were here, they had poor Wilhelmina Benninghoff and laying on the floor in the parlor. And we were, couldn't figure out why she was laying on the floor in the parlor and we still don't know why she was laying on the floor. But anyway, um, they, they will be here. October or November 28th is the annual meeting of the Butler County Historical Society. You will be getting an invitation in the mail, but it's going to be at Berkeley this year. Um, and the theme is going to be those of you that remember when we did the Liars Club, we are bringing the Liars Club back because we figured as boring, or I'd say boring, but as serious as things have been the last 18 months, we wanted something that was going to be funny. And if you don't know what the Liar Club is, we will hold an item up like this. Remember the old show to tell the truth? You will get, I don't know if we're gonna do three or four panelists. We'll all tell you what they think this is. Then the audience gets to vote as to who's telling the truth. And I will tell you the last time we did this, my husband was one of the panelists. We purposefully had it so he didn't tell the truth until the second to the last item. And when he told it, nobody voted for him because it said he hasn't been right the whole time. <laughs> so that will be the program. It's a lot of fun. Uh, December 5th is the German Village Christmas Walk. It is a go this year, but it is not going to be in the format that you all know. Um, most of the homeowners are very reluctant to open their homes up because of the COVID. So it's going to be an all outdoor event. We're moving the entertainment totally outside. Santa, instead of being in here, is going to be on our front porch still seeing the kids. Um, we're going to have more entertainment outside and going to at least try to, to go with the event this year. So it still is the first Sunday. Uh, did we change it to noon to four instead of well, noon to five instead of one to five or noon, noon, to, five. noon to five? So uh, we hope to welcome you all back for the Christmas walk. And I'm going to do two more shameful commercials. We have two new books in our library, in our bookstore out there. Um, I don't know how many of you know Shy O'Neill. Um, she lives over in Dayton Lane, uh, has a brand new book called, called Haunted Hamilton. And there's an ugly picture on page 44 that I don't want to talk about. <laughs> but uh, we have the book in stock if you're interested in it. Uh, we do have it for sale. And we also have Richard H. Jones book on the, it's called Silent uh, rise and it's the story of how the arts, the fit, fit and Center and everything started here in Hamilton. It's a very, very interesting read. Um, so we have both of those books in print or in, out in our bookstore. Um, poor Rick, you know, Sandy's bringing them in. He couldn't sell any of them. He gave me three, I immediately sold them. So he gave me four more and I've sold two out of four of them and I'm the only one selling them for him. So uh, anyway, if you're looking for the two new titles, we have them. And of course, if you're members, you get 10% discount. So, okay, let's go ahead and start on tonight's program because you're sick and tired of listening to me rattle on. Um, we're going to talk about Victorian mourning traditions or funeral traditions. And I hope most of you got a chance to go see the exhibit that we have in the house. Those of you that know about our ghosts, Wilhelmina Benninghoffen is very upset that there's a coffin in the formal parlor but I just tell her she's gonna to have to get over it. You know, what can I do? Anyway, um, so it, it's interesting because the funeral traditions that we think about started with the death of Albert, Prince Albert, Queen Victoria's husband. And those of you that know the story of, of Queen Victoria, she stayed in full mourning for the 40 years that she lived after Albert's death. Um, and Prior to that, there was some traditions, some things, but what we really think of today uh, comes from this 40 year time period uh, of the final years of uh, Queen Victoria's reign. Uh, if you see up there, that is actually the death picture that they did of uh, Albert's death. And then we have one there of Queen Victoria. She never wore anything but black after he died. Um, so it's, that's what we're gonna be talking about. And of course, 
He dies in 1861. What's going on here in the United States, but the Civil War. So America was very quick to gather the same traditions. They thought if it's, I mean, we all know whatever the royals do, we all have to pay attention to what's going on with Megan and William and, you know, whatever. It was the same thing then. We wanted to copy England. So we would go ahead and copy uh, a lot of the Victorian uh, funeral traditions and mourning traditions here in the United States. And one of the things with the Victorian time period is they wanted you to have a, what they called a good death. And it, this was very important because they believed in the final moments of death, that is when the person was determined whether they went to heaven or hell. And they were all standing around wanting to hear any final words of wisdom that the dying person would have or they wanted to kept, catch the rapture at the time that they died. You know, whoopee. But anyway, um, that is why we have this idea and you see all the people uh, would be standing around. We had that with, with Albert's death, everybody sitting in the death chamber waiting for the person to die. And the, the etiquette was extremely, extremely strict especially for women. Women got the raw end of the deal, with, especially if you were the wife, you were expected to be in mourning for two and a half years after the death of your husband. Uh, children were expected to be in mourning. Uh, we'll talk about the men in a, minute, in a little bit. They got the easy end of it. But very, they wrote books on just funeral mourning so that you wouldn't make a, an etiquette mistake. It, it was very, very strict. But you can see down here, even the little girl, the child has mourning apparel on. And we'll talk about what was re, uh, good for kids. But there was a lot of symbols that they had when you were in mourning. The first thing would be at the front door. They used black crepe or white crepe. Crepe's a type of material and the clothing, everything, when you were in high mourning, it was crepe and that was it. Uh, the white crepe was used if it was a child or a very young person that died. Otherwise it would have been black crepe. It would have been hung on the outside of the door. That's how you announce to the public that someone had died in the family. Uh, and if this had been a child, it would have been white crepe. They also, if you notice that the door is open, that is because most of the funerals, and we'll talk about why in a little bit, were held in the home. And so they didn't want, mourners didn't want to disturb the family. So they would leave the door open so that you could come in and pay your respects and leave. And those of you that looked at the funeral that we have set up in the formal parlor, that is the room, either that or a bedroom is where the corpse would have been laying. They are not big areas. So that's why they had the visitation went on during the amount of time that it was. Um, and like I said, you'd either be laid out in the formal parlor or in the bedroom. And if you notice, there's a clock up there on the mantle. All clocks in the house were to be stopped at the time that the person died. And this superstition was that if you didn't stop that, then the deceased thinks that time is continuing and they are going to continue to linger in the house and they are never going to leave the house. So the clock would be stopped and it would not be resumed until after the person was buried or if it was the main person, the main man in the house, the, the head of the household, then the one clock where he was laid out would never be started again. So this was their tradition um, that they would believe. They, they had all sorts of beliefs as to why we now have a bunch of Victorians haunting this house, but uh, we will get to that. Um, covering mirrors. They believed two things with the covered mirrors. They would either put black drapes over the mirrors or they would turn them around to face the wall. They believed that the spirit of the deceased could be trapped in the mirror and so that's why they would cover them. And they also did not want 
the living to be vain and look into themselves in the mirror because they are supposed to be thinking about the deceased and not themselves. So this is the reason why they covered mirrors. Then they were very set as to what they called memento mori, which means remember that you have to die. Symbols of this. Uh, these are all something that the woman would have worn. You have a hair comb, um, kind of like a bracelet or a necklace and then a brooch. And they are made out of what is called jet. Jet was the one stone that was considered okay for mourning jewelry. And you go, well, what is it? I've never heard of it. Well, it's, it's a mineral called ignite, or ignite, I assume that's how you pronounce it, it's I-G-N-I-T-E. And what it basically is, is fossilized wood. And that if you give it long enough, it's gonna turn into coal. And the idea that we've all heard the term jet black, that's where it came from, was the morning jewelry. Um, the first year, high morning for the woman was the first year and one day after their husband died, they could only wear the black at that time. When they went to the next stage of mourning, they were allowed to add pearls to this, diamonds to this, um, something white, and that was it. They could not wear any other jewelry other than their wedding ring. Very, very strict as to what the woman could or could not wear. The other thing, once you got out of high mourning, you could wear something like this. These are what they call mourning jewelry. The jewelry could be made out of the person's hair. And we'll talk about hair art in the next slide. Or it could be, uh, in the case of this one right here, uh, it actually was a child that died and it's a picture of the child. So it's okay in the locket to wear the picture of the child or general mourning pictures um, like in the cemetery or the willow, which is a very um, common, if you go to the older cemeteries, you'll see the willow trees on tombstones. And that is a very Victorian sign of uh, grieving or, or of mourning. Now, hair art is interesting. Most people assume that this is, it's called mourning hair. Most people assume that's the only reason why you would do pictures like this, but, some of these hair wreaths, if you've seen them, are huge. So either the lady had hair down to her ankles or it wasn't strictly for death. A lot of times these were done um, as like say a family tree. We have one in our collection that we have the history of and the, they had a family reunion and the lady who did the wreath collected samples of hair from every member of the family. And so it was a living family tree. So if you find jewelry pieces, um, we have several pieces of jewelry here uh, that is mourning hair from the deceased. But you think about the Civil War and you think about World War I where they cut off and put the locket of their sweetheart's hair into a locket, that's considered mourning hair also. Um, so you've gotta be kind of careful when you look at that stuff People just say, oh, it's creepy. Well, it's really human hair. And the reason they do it, human hair never deteriorates. You dig up, I mean, they're digging up some of these tombs in Egypt and stuff, and the people's hair is still on the mummies. Um, hair does, just does not deteriorate. Another thing that was very common was funeral photographs. Now, in the top one here, the young lady with the pearls around her neck is dead. Over here, the little girl is dead, and down here, the baby is dead. The idea of the daguerreotype came out in 1839, and that was the first photography that they had. And a lot of times they took these funeral pictures because it was the only picture that they had of the deceased. So it was a way that they could remember them. Now you look at the lady up there, her eyes are open. They are painted on after the picture is developed. Um, it was a common with a lot of these pictures that they would go in and put rosy cheeks on the dead, um, do some coloration, but that is the idea of the funeral pictures. Now, I'm just curious to know in my family, and I thought it was really gross until I started studying this, um, they had a habit, my older aunts, 
when one of them died, they all took pictures of them in the coffin. Does anybody else? I mean, this was all the way back in the 1980s, 90s. Anybody else? Or is it just my family? Mm -hmm. Okay, you've got, this is where it came from. This is why they were doing it. Um, so I guess, you know, it's not as strange at all. Plus you wanted to be pictured a lot of times in mourning up there in the top right, we have Queen Elizabeth, I'm, I'm sorry, Queen Victoria with two of her daughters. The picture of Albert is in the background. Of course, the queen is in high mourning. The two daughters are in what they call uh, the lower stages half mourning. Uh, they are in probably light gray dresses with black trim, uh, which is the second degree or second stage of mourning for wearing. Um, so it's probably, uh, Albert's been dead at least a year to year and a half at the time because of the uh, mourning that the daughters are wearing. Now this picture over here is a very interesting picture. If you think it looks familiar, it's because it's hanging at the bottom of the stairs in our house. Uh, this is Amelia Freckling. She dies at the age of 15. And the photograph in the center is Amelia. The picture, the painting was done after she died. And it was common to paint pictures a lot of times. If you had a photograph, then they would paint the formal painting after the person died. And if you notice, her pose is the same. Everything's the same, except in being in a white dress, they have her in high mourning. Um, but the book, everything else in that picture is basically the same. But uh, this was another typical way of remembering the deceased. Now, you didn't really publish in the newspaper when people died. Uh, before the 1830s, when someone died, they would send out um, invitations to the funeral. And that's what these two are, are invitations. These are 1830 or earlier. Um, gives you that you're invited to the family. Now this uh, Marietta McBride, those of you that know Hamilton history, that was a infant daughter of James McBride, our first Hamilton mayor that died at birth. Um, and it's an invitation to her funeral. Um, and this is how they announced to people other than putting the black crepe on the door that someone has died, telling them when the, when the funeral is going to be uh, the information. The same one, only this is an older gentleman over there. What's interesting in the other one, they're both buried at Greenwood, but the gentleman is 50, I think 57 years old and it's in both English and German. So uh, that way people would understand the invitation. Now this is gonna fall out of favor when we get into the 19, or 1830s and then they're going to be publishing the death notice if it was a larger city in the newspaper. And then after the funeral, they would make funeral cards up, kind of like the memorial things we pick up today, have information about the person's death when they die, their age, uh, well, the black one happens to be an adult, the white one happens to be a child. Um, they were very strict as to what size they would be, what the color would be, uh, what the information was. This was sent to people that either could not make the funeral, uh, that they lived too far away, um, or if they couldn't have that many people at the funeral because the place was small, or these were kept at family members You'd put them in like the family album as the memorial that you had that the person died. So these were very, very common uh, once you get to the end. And if you got a funeral invitation or one of these cards, you were expected to be there. It wasn't just a nice thing saying, you got this, you were there. And especially if it was somebody high profile that died, you wouldn't get in to the small area unless you presented the invitation to the funeral. The next thing, the idea is of the wake. And it's interesting that when the person died, it was not the family that washed the corpse and put the clothing on it. It was done by a family friend. They, the feeling was is that of course the family had enough going on with, with the death and all this kind of stuff that they wanted to do something This fell to the realm of the friends to do this for the family. And the idea of the wake I could remember as a kid, and I don't remember what movie it was, that they had the John Barleycorn Festival for the wakes, the Irish wakes. And I thought it was a lot of drinking and, and all this kind of stuff going on. 
Well, the reason they had the wakes, once the person died, somebody sat with the corpse until they were buried. And that was because they didn't know if the person was dead or not. Um, a lot of times people would fall into a coma and they had no idea they were in a coma. They assumed they were dead. And so they'd be in the middle of the wake, somebody would be sitting there waiting and all of a sudden the person would sit up and go, hey, what's going on? It happened because they had no way to test to see if the person was actually in a coma or if they were actually dead. So this was why they would have the wake. Um, you also go, well, why the flowers? They usually had lots of flowers and lots of candles. They weren't embalming at that point. So it, sometimes they would hold the body as much as three to four days to give people enough time to get there. Friends, relatives, you know, you're coming by horse and buggy, you can't get there, can't jump on a plane and come. So that's why you have all of the flowers. Um, then, like I said, the casket would either be in the bedroom or the formal parlor. And we have found out we've got our casket in the wrong place up there. We're gonna to have to move it. They would have had it closer to the window. And the reason is, is that if you couldn't get in because too many people were wanting to this way, people could watch through the window and pay their respects. Um, the thing we're not sure on is which direction you'd have the head and which direction you would have the feet. And you, you, you wonder, why do I say that? Well, when you would carry the corpse out, you would always carry them out feet first. You would not carry them out head first because they believed that the person would look back at the house and then leave the casket and go back to the house. So if they can't see the house when they're being carried out, then they'll stay in the casket. Um, so again, just very strict superstition. Uh, the case up here, pallbearers were not members of the family. It was close friends, as close to the age of the person that died it was possible. In the case up here, this must have been a young girl that died. And those six of her friends from school are carrying the casket. And when a young person died, like I said, with the white crepe, instead of being black, a child was always in white for innocence and death. Um, the other picture down here happens to be Abraham Lincoln's funeral entourage. Um, you're starting by the 1860s, getting the idea of a funeral director. There is no such thing as a funeral home yet. But the funeral director's job was to provide the horse-drawn hearse, the horses, the decorations for the hearse. Um, the richer you were, the more plumes you put on the horses, the number of horses you had. All of the <clears throat> hearses had glass so that as you're being taken to the cemetery, the people could see the, the casket inside. Um, if it was a child that died, it would be a white horse or a white hearse pulled by white ponies. And so again, they carried out the color scheme depending okay. on whether it was a child or there was an adult dying. Uh, it's interesting, I started doing some research here in Hamilton to find out who was the first funeral home. It was Cahill um, was the first funeral home and we start finding records for it in the early 1890s. So prior to that, and that's when they would start then doing some of the funerals from the funeral home. But if you weren't buried from your house, they may have moved the body to the church for the ceremony and then uh, gone to the church or gone to the cemetery after that. Now, I told you that the wake idea was that they weren't sure if you were in a coma or not. Well, people were terrified that they were going to be buried alive. And you've probably heard some of these horror stories when they dug people up and they see fingernail scratches on the inside. Those were people that literally had been buried alive, not on purpose, but because they were in a coma and they came to. And so Victorians were scared to death. They were gonna be buried alive. So this top one was an idea that they came up with that they put you in the coffin and after they put you in the ground, they put a string in your hand. 
The string ran out of the coffin, out of the ground, and it was hooked to a bell outside. So that if you came to, you could ring the bell. And that's where the saying saved by the bell comes from. You literally could say, hey, get me dug up before I suffocate in here, I'm still alive. Then there was a physician, his name was Dr. Timothy uh, Clark Smith. He was so terrified of being buried alive that he designed his own uh, monument or whatever you want to call it. And he put a 14 inch glass window in it and had a 14 inch glass window so people could look down to see if he was really alive in there or not. Well, when he died, he, he was really dead. And it's kind of uh, interesting to know he dies on Halloween. <laughs> but, you know, they were very concerned about this. The other thing they were concerned about was grave robbers. And they would hire people <laughs> to stay supposedly and watch the grave. And you go, why would anybody want to, I mean, in Egypt, sure, they, they buried treasures with these people, but why back here now? Well, there was a really good reason. Medical schools needed cadavers for doctors to practice on. The only legal cadaver that a medical school could get was a prisoner that had been executed because of the death penalty. There wasn't a lot of those around. So they would pay grave robbers to go rob the graves. And this, especially in the Cincinnati area, this was, because we had several medical schools here, this was a big problem here in Cincinnati. And how many know the story of President Benjamin Harrison's father? Or, I'm sorry, William Henry Harrison, Benjamin Harrison's son, William Henry Harrison's father. Dies down in Harrison, the family hires a grave watcher to make sure his body doesn't get stolen. Well, the guy either fell asleep on the job or was in on it. He disappears, the body. They found him hanging in a cooler in one of the medical hospitals, or medical schools down in Cincinnati, true story. So people were scared to death. How did they uh, steal the bodies? If you see in this case, they're pulling the lady out by the neck. That was the preferred way to do it. Um, they would either pull you out at the head of where you were buried, or they dig a tunnel over to the head so that it wasn't so obvious that the grave had been robbed. And the penalty for grave robbery was a lot worse if you took the clothing and whatever the person was buried with. So usually they would strip the corpse, put that all back in the grave and just take off with the naked corpse because then the penalty wasn't near as bad as, as grave robbery. Yeah, I know, wonderful. Um, and I know you're looking, you're going, who in heaven's name puts a chihuahua in a black dress? Victoria, especially if there was multiple deaths in one family, all of the family animals were expected to show mourning. So they would put ribbons on dogs, cats, and I, the record I saw even said the family chickens. And I'd love to know, I know my chickens on how they would put them. I'm, I'm, I'm sure my chickens would object very bad. They said chickens, any member of livestock of the family had to show signs of mourning if there was multiple deaths. Plus the Victorians were very big. If a family pet died, they would have a full funeral for the family pet. So again, very strict. So let's see some of the superstitions that we have. Um, a clap of thunder following a burial indicates that the soul has de that departed has reached heaven. So that's your thunderbolt up there. Um, if you can hear three knocks, that means someone close to you has just died. I'm like, oh, great. Um, if you smell roses and there's none around, someone is about to die. Uh, how many of you did this and not know why? If as a kid you passed a graveyard, you held your breath until you were passed? Just my sister and I were the only ones that fell for this one. Uh, and I never knew why. That was a Victorian superstition that you held your breath passing a graveyard. 
I know because I those of you who know I grew up in the Chicago area, some of those things were huge, and my sister and I were turning blue by the time we got past. <laughs> but uh, again, a Victorian idea. Uh, if the bird pecks or crashes into your window, or in the case of my mother, if the bird flew into the house, she was terrified because that was a sign someone was about to die. And we had this problem all the time when I was growing up. Uh, but uh, yeah, if the bird comes to your window, um, still salt. How many of you heard it that you take a pinch and threw it over your shoulder to prevent death? Still do it. Victorian funeral superstition. Um, if you hear the cry of a curlew or the, hurt, uh, or the hoot of the owl, that foretells death coming. Or if a dog howls at night uh, when someone in the house is sick, that means that person's going to die. And the way to reverse that, don't ask me why, is to reach under your bed and turn a shoe over. <laughs> but that's how you reverse that superstition. So some of these superstitions, as you know, the pinch of salt. My sister and I holding our breath going past cemeteries as kids, we never knew why. We just knew you were supposed to do it. Uh, another one was that if you were a uh, funeral procession was coming towards you, you were supposed to turn your back to it. And if you couldn't turn your back, then you were supposed to hold a button. I don't know, but Victorian superstitions. Clothing, I touched on this a little bit. For women, it was extremely severe. The woman was expected, if it was her husband, to be in mourning for a minimum of two and a half years. Or in the case of Queen Victoria, it was 40 years. Um, and you wore crepe black the first year and one day that you were in mourning. And if you look in the ensemble over here, your hat or your bonnet, you wore a bonnet. You did not wear a hat. You were required to wear a bonnet with a full veil over it for the first year and one day. Um, your purse, your gloves, even your underwear had to have, the purse and everything was black, your underwear would have black ribbon sewn onto it. Everything you wore had to show that you were in mourning. So you can see here some of the different styles depending on uh, what era the mourning was in, but very, very strict. The woman was supposed to show that her life, she is so destitute and everything else over this death that she has like no social life at all. She's not even supposed to come out in public for the first year. Um, then when we get to the next, what they call half mourning, you're going to start, this would be at the end of the first year for the next six months, you could wear, you can see we have some purple on this dress. We've got the white collar. So you're starting to show, you're still very deep in mourning, but you're starting to get a little color. Cause so you compare this to the lady over there that's in full mourning. You can see what the, the mourning hat and the mourning veil or the, the bonnet, they call them bonnets, not hats. You are not allowed to wear a hat. Um, so you can see we're starting to come out of mourning at this point. Um, and you were here from uh, the, first year in a day to the next nine months, you were in this stage. Then you would go to the next stage, which is usually the last stage of mourning. Um, you can see here, we're wearing blue, we're wearing gray, uh, you can wear brown. You don't have to wear black all the time, but again, it has to be very muted colors. And then as you get further out, like Queen um, Victoria's daughters were wearing in the, the picture, that's why I said there are at least two years for mourning, you can go to white or cream because that was also considered a mourning color. But again, you still have the black trim on there to show that you are still um, in mourning. So very, very strict for women. So now you go, well, what about men? Men were lucky. First of all, most of their suits were probably black or very dark brown. And because the man was expected to be out in the workforce working, he only had to show high mourning or the strict mourning three months. And most of the time then, all he's going to wear is an armband around his arm. Uh, you can see here that I'm assuming that this is probably the father and the two daughters on either side there in high mourning, but he's getting by with just a dark suit and then 
Later, he will just go to an armband. Uh, same thing with the picture over there, you can see with the gentleman. It, what's interesting is the center picture there is from Queen Victoria's funeral. Those are, those of you that know the, the story of Queen Victoria, she has all these girls and they go marry all the, the royalty throughout Europe. They come back for the funeral and they're refusing to wear the veils. They're refusing to wear the deep mourning. They said enough of them is enough of this. And so this, this picture is actually from Queen Victoria's funeral. Um, and then of course we know <laughs> Scarlett O'Hara and Gone with the Wind. As I said, the widow was not supposed to come out in public for a year. After that, then she can make some social small appearances, but certainly you wouldn't go to a ball. And if you remember the scene from Gone with the Wind, they are all just shocked that she is there in her widow weeds, um, very much anti what would have been done during that time period. So, because uh, you look in there and you look at all the bright ball dresses and everything else, and there's Scarlet and her widow weeds. Yeah, they're very, very bad. Um, but the problem with the woman, too, is by the time she starts coming back totally into the society after two and a half years, with her husband dying, she may now be penniless, penniless. She may not be the social standard she was. She's been gone for two and a half years, so she's dropped down the pecking order. And it's very difficult for the woman to regain her status in society. So it was very, very, like I said, the men had it easy. The women really had it bad. Um, even if the man, let's say the, the, his wife died, and let's say he remarries within six months of the death of his first wife, if there was children involved, this was very common. He could get by with the, the band, but his new wife had to go into full mourning and go through the two and a half years for the, for the first wife. So the woman lost no matter what happened. Um, here you can kind of get the idea for the children. The poor little baby there has got the armbands. We have the young man with the armbands. Um, this is what they would do. If a parent died, the children were expected to be in mourning for a year. Um, if it was a sibling that died, six months, uh, and her uncle, cousin, six months, three months. It wasn't near as severe for kids. Um, but again, still, it was, if it was a baby, it would be armbands, or if the baby, so many of the babies were in white anyway, that was considered a uh, mourning color for a child, so you were fine as long as the baby was in white. This is Queen Victoria's funeral. And you can see in there, the, in the center is the family. And some of the women are not in the full veils like you would think. They started criticizing the news media, if we want to go there, Charles Dickens was one of them, was criticizing the strict Victorian funeral traditions by the 1870s, the 1880s, the 1890s. They said, this is just way too strict. So you can see that the royal family is not necessarily even at Queen Victoria's funeral following what she had done. Um, and so the problem with this so much too is if you think about it and you look back at the hearses and everything else, families would go into severe debt because they felt that they had to show the highest form of uh, funeral and mourning as they can. So it became one upsmanship as to who could have the bigger funeral for their relative. And people were literally spending their life savings to put on a funeral that they thought they needed to do. So Dickens and the media and everything else is starting to challenge these ideas going, this isn't right, we need to do away with this. And once Queen Victoria died, they said, good. You know, <laughs> she was the one that was setting it all. Um, and so we move ahead to the turn of the century and fashions are starting to change. You don't have the long dresses, but you're still wearing the black, especially if you're the woman until World War I comes along. And that was really the ending of the Victorian funeral traditions because the government 
wanted to get morale high? And how can you keep morale up if three quarters of the female population is walking around in morning clothes? It does not work. Um, those of you that have heard my talk on Spanish influenza and COVID, um, the US government wouldn't even talk about Spanish influenza because it was hurting morale. And so government edict, you didn't talk about Spanish influenza because it was bad for morale. Same thing with they're trying to dictate women's fashions. So you might wear black for a while, but you really didn't. And then the other thing that's going to come out right about that time is once we get past World War I, we get into the Roaring Twenties. And you think about the flapper dresses and everything else. Well, ladies, we all at one time had our little black dress. That came out in the Roaring Twenties, the idea of the little black dress being high society. And so black now is no longer considered a mourning color necessarily. It was a color for high society. So we've got a lot of changes here that's going on. They also are going to start wearing different types of mourning jewelry. Um, the one up in the corner is something that would have been worn for the assassination of President Lincoln. Uh, a lot of this would have been stuff, you have the black armband. band. This is what men would have used for mourning purposes. Um, and so this was very, very popular at that time. Uh, but again, by the time we get to World War I, it's falling out of favor. And by the time we get past World War I, it's basically uh, no longer happening. So let's go ahead today and look to see a little bit on how funeral tradition, funeral customs today still mimic the Victorian time period. Now, I hope I'm not the only one in here that has been guilty of this, but you go to the visitation, you stand in the long line, you get up there and what is the first thing you say? Oh, he or she looks so natural <laughs> or he or she looks just like they're sleeping and you're thinking under that, they're dead, what am I talking about? But that goes back to the Victorian idea of the laying out. The, what we say and how we act at funerals all go back to this Victorian time period. Um, we all file in, get in the line. Um, you know, it's continuation of what was done 100, 150 years ago. And then let's take at the funeral possession, procession. In Victorian time period, you had the first hearse was the deceased. The next carriage, carried the pallbearers. The next carriage carried the family. And then after that, we had everybody that left was going to the cemetery. Well, I think the only thing they've changed today is we have the police escort, we have the flower car, and then everything is exactly the same order that they had in the Victorian time period. And this is where that idea comes from. Like I said, instead of carriages, we now use automobiles. But again, the idea goes back to the Victorian time period. And then we all thought the hair art was kind of strange. Now, this really perturbed me when I found out that if your loved one is cremated, you can put them into jewelry. You can put them into a Christmas ornament. There is all sorts of things you can make out of the cremains. And, uh, I was actually talking to one of our uh, guests that came in on Tuesday and she says, yeah, I usually have my dad and the bottle around my neck. I just don't have him on today. And I'm like, okay. Um, of course we have, if you go into our funeral exhibit in there, there is an urn sitting on the hall tree. That is a real urn. The guy donated his wife's ashes and a gold pocket watch here. Why we accepted it in the 1950s, I have not got a clue. But uh, anyway, that is Victorian funeral traditions. And does anyone have any questions? Yes, Rustin. I guess common sense and the whole money and social strata and everything. Like when JFK died, you know, the whole form of mm. veil and black and yep. everything. So I guess I'm just wondering. I, it depends on the family and the social status and the money and 
the higher up you are in society, the bigger funeral you have today. And I'm just going to make a comment about the JFK funeral. Those of you that know, they said that Jackie Kennedy wanted to recreate the Lincoln funeral as best as she could. And I have to laugh that when Lincoln was assassinated, his funeral train was supposed to take the exact same route that it took when Lincoln came from Springfield, went to Washington. Well, the inaugural train never went to New York City, never went to Chicago. Uh, it, did, it went through um, Cambridge City in Indiana. Well, the funeral train going back never went to Cambridge City because that was out of the way to get to Chicago. And so they didn't quite do it the way it was supposed to be done. But uh, yeah, Lincoln's funeral was extremely, extremely extravagant. Um, those of you that know, I was a docent at the Abraham Lincoln Presidential Library and Museum. And we love to tell the story about they tried to steal Lincoln's body. Have you heard this one? Um, it was about 10 years after he was buried and some uh, criminals up in Chicago, they were counterfeiters. The, had counterfeiter gotten arrested and was in jail. So they decided they were going to kidnap Lincoln's body and hold the body until they released the, the counterfeiter. Well, the one guy made a mistake that he went into a brothel before they went to Springfield and was um, bragging to the girl that they were going to do this. So she goes, the Pinkerton detectives had been created by this point. So she goes to the Pinkerton detectives in Chicago, tells them what they heard. So they send them down to uh, the cemetery in Springfield. They know what day it's going to happen. And it's just like Keystone cops. Um, they get in there, they tr they're trying to get the coffin out. They can't get the coffin out. And the one of the Pinkertons drops his gun or something. The gun goes off, scares the burglars. I mean, they finally eventually do catch the guys, but those of you that know anything about Lincoln's tomb, after this happened, Robert Todd Lincoln, his only child that makes it to adulthood, at that time is the lawyer for the Pullman family in Chicago. And the Pullman railroad car strike is going on and Pullman dies during it. They are afraid that they are going to dig him up and desecrate the body. So they have him buried under uh, rye bar and cement so he can't be dug up. So when they go to bury Lincoln the last time, the poor guy had been uh, embalmed so many times during the funeral thing back, they wanted to make sure that they had the right body and he was perfect condition. And this is like 30 years after he dies um, because after they tried to steal him, they, they hide him in the cemetery in Springfield until they can recreate the tomb. Um, and Lincoln is buried under rye bar and um, concrete, and he's not underneath the sarcophagus. He's off to the side so that they can't find him. <laughs> but anyway, that's the story of Lincoln. But, uh, anybody else have any other questions or comments? Anything from, check and see if there's anything on the, uh, anyone over there on Zoom have any questions? If you do, you can unmute and ask. Yeah. On the funeral cards? Mm -hmm. Uh, I know during World War One, they, those were generally at the mass that was in the church. When you were given out, they were expected to have it. Right. Well, that's that was the beginning of what we have today. Now, the the cards that they hand out at the funeral homes, um, and that all goes back to the funeral announcement that came in after roughly the mid 1830s. Some of them are pretty elaborate. Yeah. The photography and the color work. Right. Did. Yes. I did have a, a, a comment and a question. If anybody watches drug history, they do an episode of the Attempted Theft of Lincoln's Body. It's pretty funny. Mm -hmm. um, the doctor that that made his own his tombstone with the glass, is he buried locally? Or I, he's out place? east someplace. Okay. For some reason, I'm thinking it's New Jersey. Um, but he is someplace out on the and East Coast. The the, uh, that was a modern picture of his grave. Yes. Wow. Wow. <laughs> I would imagine that the glass down on his tombstones, probably you can't see through it anymore. But yeah, he's still buried that way. So. Do we have any questions from my Zoom audience? 
Okay, well, if we don't have any questions, I thank you for coming tonight. Uh, if you haven't seen the exhibit, take a look. We still